You said you'd have to go a couple seconds faster. What time do you think it'll take to medal in the 4 a.m.? I think 407. 407 what? Anything? Hi. Hi. I think you're yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, around there. I don't know anybody's fast right now. Will you do the haka for us? Welcome back to the Social Kick Podcast. I'm Brian Lundquist. We get a full crew this time. Dr. John Mullen, Luke Paddington, and World Championship Bronze Medalist, Lewis Clairbert. What's up, Lewis? Hey, not much. Just cruising, eh? Yeah, yeah cruising's in the Sub 410 Club, we see. Look at Whoa. you, big guy. <laughs> yeah, a bit surprising. <laughs> I don't know. Is it surprising? You tell us. I mean, um, I think for that this time of the year or when I did it was probably a little bit weird. Um, definitely wasn't expecting it, but um, to have it to come through and I guess do it by myself was was pretty exciting. Well, tell me about that because I get the feeling that you do a lot of stuff by yourself uh, living in New Zealand and in the training group where you are. Uh, give us a sense of all of that. What's going on with your training group? I feel like you're used to being solo. Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of the stuff I do is definitely by myself. It's I think being on the side of the world, you're obviously not exposed to much of you know the international scene, and um, a lot of the stuff we do from day to day is actually just you know I guess what we think is going to work. Um, you know, there's not that many Kiwis, um, I guess, in New Zealand that are swimming. Um, or trying to be the best in the world or trying to perform at the international stage. So what we do is purely just, you know, what we think and what we think might work. And yeah, I mean, it's a shame, but a lot of the stuff we do is actually by ourselves. Um, we are just across the ditch from Aussie, but obviously the Australians uh, have been a little bit out of touch in the last year um, with COVID and it's only sort of just starting to now um sort of we've just joined that bubble that has um, put New Zealand, Australia, I guess, put on the same map. Um, mm. But it's it's still difficult because it always it's always opening and closing. So like at the moment, Melbourne is closed to New Zealand. So we, we can't go over there. And that was going to be our ticket away for um, for Tokyo coming up because mm. we were going to use Melbourne to, to get over to Tokyo. But now with that mm. sort of off limit, we, we're not sure how we're actually going to get to Tokyo. <laughs> but oh. yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely hard um, having to train by yourself, but I guess it makes it all that much better when you get to race and um, go over to international competitions and, and use the extra motivation of racing people. What about a cruise ship? They got pools on them so you could take a boat to Tokyo <laughs> and swim yeah, on I mean, the way there. Easy. Um, yeah, I mean, anything yeah. works, I guess. <laughs> yeah, sponsor, we good. All right. Well, I want to circle back to that 409. You you already touched on a bunch of things we're going to get into here, but you you had a great swim, broke 410. Like you said, sounds like you were surprised. Sounds like your coach was surprised. Are you one of those distant swimmers that doesn't need to taper to go best times? Because none of us understand that at all. But maybe talk us through. Did you go in rested, and why did it surprise you so much? Yeah, I mean, we we usually do like a four week taper, but for our trials, we we did it only three weeks and it was a little bit different to what we would usually do. Um, I definitely enjoy a taper. I think every swimmer can probably vouch for that, but I'm not sure how um, complete it is compared to other swimmers. Obviously being on the other side of the world, I don't really know how anyone else tapers. So I'm just doing my own thing. And um, a lot of our sets are actually based off um, Doug Frost and what um, Ian Thorpe used to do. So I guess we have a little bit of an Australian connection there, but um, yeah, <laughs> it was surprising being able to go under the the four ten, and I think that for where we were at the um, the taper and how the build up was going, I was just aiming for like a four eleven, um, which I thought might have put me in a good position come Tokyo on the program. Um, but yeah, to get the four oh nine, I think it was just um, a mixture of things that went right on the night. We're actually running on the night. It was like the first night of the competition and we were running 40 minutes late and the sessions weren't that long. So I couldn't move my warm up um, any later because I was actually already in the pool by the time the competition had started. So I was sitting around for like 40 minutes before I actually got to race, which is not usually what I do. I'm usually sort of 20 minutes or 10 minutes 
quickly put my suit on and then then race so it was it was a mixture of things that went right and went wrong but somehow it came out positive and i went a 409 <laughs> any learnings there for you for what to change in the future i mean is that not having a warm-up right before and kind of shaking you off of that typical routine or you like is that uh you know light up any light bulbs in your head yeah i mean i i think i'd still want to keep the same schedule as what i usually do but i mean it's good to know that if something like that happens at the olympics where there's you know an event that you might not might not know that's going to happen like a 40 minute delay i can still perform when i need to and sort of psychologically can get up for it if it if something like that does happen so i definitely won't want to change it but if something does happen, I know I can trust myself and back myself that um, I can still swim fast. And this might sound like a strange question because you weren't racing anybody next to you, but did you know you're going fast? Did you feel good? You know, sometimes you just know that I'm feeling good. This is this is on. You know, you're by yourself. How did you feel in the race? Yeah, I mean, I guess for IMA, you split it up into four parts of the race. So for the fly, I, I mean, I felt average. It wasn't. It didn't feel great, mm. but it was relatively easy. And then the back never feels any good for some reason um and then it wasn't until i got to the breaststroke where i was actually i was feeling pretty nice um Mm -hmm. and i felt like i had a good rhythm and i was actually going quite fast um and then i guess by the time i got to the freestyle i was still reasonably fresh um compared to what i would usually feel like in say a training set or past 400 medleys so um it was definitely I was definitely in the fields where I was like, oh, actually, you know, this is actually could be a good swim. Um, but obviously when you're racing no one or when everyone else is quite a, a wee bit behind you and you don't really, can't really judge where you are, it's still sort of difficult during the race to to know exactly what time you're going. And you oh. continue good swimming for the rest of the meets. I mean, you had good times, you had 2 a.m., you lead off, you relay, what have you. So, I mean, can you attribute that to just the work you guys put in in the last year and and how has that work been different you, you, your coach is gary hollywood right so and yeah. and you said you do a lot of stuff that doug frost would have done how has your work been different since you came off my isl say so now yeah i mean going to isl i mean i guess i could probably that's where it all restarted i guess um mm-hmm. i went to isl and i got eaten up like it was no tomorrow i got absolutely smoked um so it was it was pretty difficult coming back from there and thinking like what do I have to do to get better, and I think the biggest thing was actually going and training and racing with those international guys in the short course meters, and thinking and what and actually you know seeing it firsthand that my turns in underwaters were absolutely atrocious, and so I sort of came back reset, took a few things from what I got from um, those guys internationally that you know obviously we don't really get here in New Zealand. And I tried to incorporate it into my training um, as well. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it's was it been a, a long year to from ISL to, to rebuild and to, to get to where I am here now today. But, um, you know, I think going to ISL, I took a lot of learning and it, it's been, yeah, it's been a little bit different. Um, and... Gary has has been pretty, just super supportive along the way. He wasn't originally supported, supportive of me going to ISL, but then I think he realised that it was actually um, good to have a you know a different experience and and learn from it. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a different perspective because we talked to a lot of Americans, we talk with a lot of Brits, and obviously they have a lot of training people in their groups or people on their national team they work with. So it's great to hear how ISL sounds like you know, influenced you or you were able to surround yourself and learn from some of the other great swimmers. Um, were there specific swimmers that you learned from and what did you grab from them? Yeah, I mean, I took a little bit of a piece of um, from a few people. So I was lucky that I could, I was training um, sometimes along Joe Litchfield. So obviously he's like the king of underwaters at the moment. So um, he was sort of eating me up a little bit there. So I was able to, I guess, see that I was getting um, absolutely thrashed and I was asking him a few questions about, you know, what he does in his training to, um, I guess, let him or let him go so far underwater or do what he does underwater. And so I sort of tried to incorporate a few of those things that he told me just, just this, it was pretty simple. He was just like, well, I do this every day in training and I try to go as far as off the walls I can every day in training. And I guess it just, 
translate into the, the poem. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, it's pretty simple stuff. Um, another one that I was um, I was pretty stoked to be able to train along was Jan. I don't actually know how to say his last name, but he um, the po- he's from Poland. Yeah. And he, I think he used to train with, he used to train in Florida with. Um, Is it Switkowski? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the one. Uh-huh. Yeah. So he, he used to train with Dressel and stuff. Um, yeah. And train alongside him, he was also really good at kick, and he was smoking me in all the kick sets that we did. So, um, you know, I knew that I needed to be faster at kick, and he was also way better than me at pull. So I knew I needed to be faster at pull. But in the swimming, I was sort of a little bit more competitive. But it was those two individual, I guess, aspects of the race or the trainings that he was so much better than me at. Yeah. Uh, so have you implemented the underwater kicking? Are you doing that now on a daily basis? Yeah. I'm trying to do it every day and it's probably the hardest thing mentally for me to do every day during a, you know, a 400 IM set when you're trying to go 15 meters underwater. Um, but I think it's not something that you can just implement straight away. It's something that is going to take a few years and I don't think I'll get it right this year, but it might be a few years that down the track that it might just click for me. Yeah, it seems like the kind of thing that you just have to commit to doing. Uh, mm-hmm. There's no way around getting good at being underwater, except for just holding your breath and staying under. Just suck it up. Yeah, that's pretty much what it is. <laughs> Dude, how do you how do you stay motivated? Uh, I mean, you must have a ton of intrinsic motivation uh, to to be able to train at the level that's required for you to be at such an elite level without. Um, you know, and no disrespect, I, I, I'm curious to know what, what's like the nature of your training environment, but I, I venture to guess like there's a lot of it where you're totally alone or you're doing paces that, you know, your teammates can't even touch. So like, you know, you got to come in and want it and earn it on a daily basis. Um, what, what motivates you? Yeah. I mean, Coming from New Zealand, you're absolutely right. It's all, well, most of it's intrinsic motivation. Like I, you know, I have the goal of going to Olympics. You know, I've got a little thing up there where it is. I kind of pointed out. Yeah, I, you know, the goal of going to Olympics and getting a little gold medal, you know, that's been the goal for my whole life since I started swimming. Um, and unfortunately, yeah, you're right. It's a lot of it has been by myself. Um, I've been lucky that, a lot of the guys that I'm training with um, have been super supportive. So um, after trials, instead of having a break, they've been training alongside me and helping me out. Um, hmm. And I guess, yeah, a lot of the time they've had to like, um, alter their training to to do what I'm doing. Um, not all of them are 400 medley swimmers, but quite a lot of them are having to do 400 medley sets. And Ooh. some of them are a lot tougher than than they would usually do and sometimes i've had to throw on some fins or alter alter the set to um to stay in the same lane as me um because that's another problem that we've been having is there's not a lot of knowledge around swimming here in new zealand and we all train in public pools so space is a huge problem um so we we can't actually get the right space so i I have to share lanes with people that might not be doing the same sets with me or the training programs as me Um, but yeah, it has been difficult to, I guess, motivate myself. But ultimately, um, I chose to stay here in New Zealand because I want the little Johnny that is growing up um, at the moment to know that if you want to be an Olympic athlete or you want to compete on the world stage and something, um, you can do it here in New Zealand. And I don't want them thinking that they have to travel or that they, they, they can't do it. I want to show them that, you know, it is possible if you, you put your mind to it and yeah, it's tough, but look, I'm, I'm happy to go all in and, and, and see what I can do. One of the toughest, um, you guys are tough, man. Kiwis are tough. If you ever, ever watch all blacks play, they're, they're tough. And the coach that turned my swimming career around was a New Zealand swimmer as well. He started 203 in the nineties, a guy called Richard Tapper. And, and Rick was one of the toughest guys on set, uh, but also one of the most loving, kind-hearted, no swimming, but he didn't take no for an answer. And he really was, you know, motivational and, and intense, really intense, but in a good way, not not crazy way. So I do, I see that in your teams, you know, you guys won the Cricket World Cup, you guys are rugby, everything. So you guys punch above your weight, I'd say. You know, mm. 
Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, we I guess a lot of us also actually take motivation from our rugby team and our mm-hmm. team because they have a lot of culture around them. Mm-hmm. And because they're such big teams that um, – they sort of bring out the culture of New Zealand and they put it on, you know, showcase to the rest of the world and with the hacker and all that sort of stuff. So a lot of us teams sort of feed off it um, as much as we can and, and try to do what they do um, and put it into our scenario of our sport. Are, are you Maori? I've got like a slight little bit of me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I bet that's important. I mean, just to represent the, the, the Maori nation and, and, and you yeah. know, be on the world stage. There are not many, so... Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, I'm super proud to be a Kiwi, and yeah. especially have that little bit of Maori in me. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to drive as much as I can for New Zealand and and see where we can we can go with this. So you're never tempted to go to the NCAA system when you were ripping up Daniel Loder's records at age 16. You're never tempted to go to you know like you you were just like dead set from that age. I'm staying with Gary and I'm doing my thing here. Um, I definitely had the want to go to america you know it was pretty enticing when you have these huge programs and they've got lots of funding and they've got the facilities that i guess promote success and i guess they provide success as well you know there's most of the world's top swimmers come out of these ncaa programs um but i guess for me i i sat down with gary and um he had produced you know quite a few olympic swimmers in the past um cory main who has only just swimming in the last few years um went to florida gators and you know mm-hmm. carved it up there um and so i sort of sat down with him and i was like look what do i do i can go to america and i can get lost in maybe the system of ncaa's um or i can go to aussie and train with them but they don't really have the IM programs that um, America can provide me or I can stay here. And he sat me down and he said, look, I'm not sure if this is the right choice, but I think you should stay here. And I think at the moment, this is the best place for you to be because one, I'm going to look after you because you're my top swimmer. And two, I don't think you're going to get, um, you know, the same support if you left New Zealand. Um, so I guess I sort of just took his word when I was 18 and I said, look, I'll stay here. And I trust that, you know, we can do this from New Zealand and I guess you haven't really looked back so far. Hmm. What do you think is the biggest challenge uh, for that? Because um, Luke uh, is from Trinidad and I've been to visit him as, as John has too. And we've swam in the pools and, you know, we see the training environment and, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, the, the Caribbean and, um, you know, the environment and, and some nations who maybe don't have the resources and you end up having a lot of the swimmers and athletes from those nations do what we just talked about, like go and train in another country and, and maybe leave that opportunity on the table to inspire, you know, others in the way that you're talking about. Um, but you know, there, there has to be some sacrifice with it, even though look at you, you've made it to, you know, the podium at, at the world level, um, you've made it happen. And so there's obviously a lot that benefits you in that, but I'm wondering um, what you think is, what challenges do you, uh, you know, come across on a daily basis that are just, you know, things that maybe a lot of us uh, privileged, like great aquatic center, California outside swimming all the time, uh, individuals, what, 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 what are we not, what do we not see? What do you have to deal with? Yeah. I mean, there's a huge list and I could probably make a book of the list of things that we don't have that Americans and other countries have. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I mean, it's difficult. I think the main thing is actually just generally the knowledge. Um, We as a country, New Zealand, you know, we know rugby, rugby and pretty much that's it. And so we know how to create good rugby teams and good rugby players, but um, for swimming, you know, we haven't had a Olympic swimming medal in what twenty five years, twenty twenty plus years, yeah. and so obviously yeah. the swimming has changed, you know, immensely since then. And um, so I guess that's probably the biggest thing: the the knowledge and that sort of even just the the general public knowledge around it. Um, you know, I train in a public pool, obviously, and a lot of the time 
I'll be training along and some random will of member of the public will jump in the lane <laughs> and will think, you know, like even though the lane's booked, they think that, you know, <laughs> it'll be it, it, I'm a public swimmer and they don't realize that you're actually going a little bit faster than they think. Um, so that's probably the biggest thing. Another thing is the facilities definitely. Um, I'm lucky. I'm lucky. Um, I guess I'm in one of the biggest. I'm in the capital city of New Zealand, which is Wellington. So we have a lot more resources than, say, what a small town would have. And we do have a 50 meter Olympic pool. Um, we've got one, <laughs> which is um, which is pretty good. We get it once a week. Um, but apart from that, you know, we're all training in public facilities that are shared with the public, um, and yeah, that's that's another hard thing. They don't really pump funding into to building new pools, and then uni- none of the universities have pools either. So that's another difficult thing. Hold on, you're only training long course once a week. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And you what? wouldn't believe the other the other uh, pool I train in is 33 uh, and a third. Oh, I hate the pools. I hate that kind. Of- <laughs> confuses you. Hate it. Confused. Wow. I don't learn those so much. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, but I'm shocked to hear uh, that that you would only train long course once a week, even throughout the summer and your preparation. Yeah, I mean it's difficult, but I think um the 33 meter pool you can sort of translate it a little bit easier than a, a 25 meter. But um, yeah, I mean it's definitely difficult having only that one session a week. But you know we we have to deal with what we have and we can't get any more space than what we have. So we just have to do what we can. Is, is Daniel Lode from the same town as you, the same part of Wellington? No, nah, he's from Dunedin. So he's all the way down the bottom. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, I was just wondering if he had, he also had similar challenges back in the nineties when he swam. But um, if anybody wants to watch a gritty swim, look at his last 50 or his 200 freestyle in Atlanta. Gustavo talked about it, that Daniel was just a freight train. And it comes back to the grid you guys have. And with, and he trained in New Zealand, right? The whole time. He didn't leave. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I'd love to learn more about what you think the country can do to support swimming. Obviously, you list a bunch of differences. Let's say, you know, you go to Olympics, you medal in the 4 a.m. In the U.S., when Phelps was tearing it up, we had the Phelps effect. More kids got into swimming. Saying you guys get the Lewis effect. You go, you medal in the 4 a.m., what can the country do to continue to support these young swimmers to build it up to a greater swimming nation? Yeah, I mean it's hard because I I wouldn't know to be honest. Um, the the thing that everyone says is you know they need there needs to be more funding, but more money just means more problems most of the time. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm not entirely sure. I I'd I'd love to see um, their be more summers um, in New Zealand. I'd love to. I'd love there to be ten summers in New Zealand, be on the world stage, um, making finals. But yeah, it's difficult. I think the biggest thing is maybe uh, the coach. We need to we need to have more coaches that know what they're doing. Maybe um, it's it's difficult because yeah, I'm, I'm feel like I'm stuck in a bubble in Wellington for the past three years and. I've just been putting my head down and just training and doing what I can. And I haven't really thought about how maybe we can change the whole New Zealand outlook on to create a better swimming environment in New Zealand. Um, but yeah, I'm open to, to, to suggestions if you guys have any differently. <laughs> it's more, it's more comments like what you made earlier in the show, just your drive and desire and your belief that you can, anybody from a kid in New Zealand town can make it make it if they really tried and we, we see that we see my country George Ravel dominated the stage for 20 years and he inspired the likes of Dylan Carter now and just by pure belief that you could medal from a little tiny I mean what's the population in New Zealand it's not much bigger than Trinidad you know you could still medal and have potential so it's it's unfortunately it's it's the opposite like you get the funding once you've achieved in a lot of our countries like what we do you know like I'm sure you didn't get any sponsors until you got your medal you're, you're spot on yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but i, I mean like you're saying i think just sorry to interrupt you i think just exposure having someone to look up to more numbers in the sport and unfortunately it is backwards like with the medal the more numbers in the more involvement the more pools should come and all that it's just um someone to look up to i think is what really helps out a lot of these developing swimming countries totally 
Mm. Yeah. yeah. And it is for me, you know, I'm trying to break the ice um, and I'm trying to make, you know, be the, the one that competes on the Olympic stage and provides that, I guess, um, that pathway for swimmers coming up that, you know, they can tick all the boxes and, and get to where hopefully I want to be and compete alongside me, hopefully. Well, let's talk Tokyo. So you've qualified and you, are you going to swim, enter the swimming at 2 and 4 a.m. and anything else? Or uh, you get a relay by any chance? Um, I think our relay just got knocked out by the Irish. Um, it's Irish. Yeah, European. <laughs> but yeah, definitely the two, 200 and 400 a.m. Um, I'm not 100% sure what other events I'm allowed to do. I think if I have a FINA B time mm -hmm. uh, and some other events and nobody else qualifies, then I might be able to do, um, I think, like the turn of butterfly and the turn of freestyle. But for me, I think I'm just going to focus on the two um, the two races that I've fully qualified for, which is the 200 and 400 a.m. So 4 a.m. still the first day. It was the first morning, like almost the first race on here. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Like, yeah. I mean, 4 a.m. still, I mean, obviously you have Sato and a few people up top, but it seems to be a pretty open event. We were talking about it, just trying to list all the people under 410, and it's three to five guys. I mean, we'll see who makes all the teams and all that. Um, what do you know about your competitors, and what are you thinking about that going into the Olympics? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool. Um, I guess some people have started racing again. You can sort of see where everyone's at. Yeah. I know that. If I want to guarantee myself a medal, I'm going to have to go at least a few seconds faster. Um, but, yeah, it's it's cool being able to meet and, I guess, meet some of these guys that I'm racing against and also see some of them racing at their trials um, the last few weeks and obviously coming up with the, the state, you know, the U.S. guys. So, um, like, I've got no idea where they are in their training and, what they're aiming for um i guess the biggest thing for me is i can only control what i do but knowing that um you always want to go faster and i think that if i want to guarantee myself a medal um i'm going to have to go a little bit faster but yeah it's pretty cool definitely seeing these other guys um swim and me sort of being a, quite competitive with those times that they're throwing down as well when we see you in the finals how can I how can I tell that Lewis is having a good race? I'm I'm not looking at your times. I'm just like, what can I notice about your swim? Is is it that your hips are up and back? Is your breaststroke is flowing really nicely? Your stroke count? How, what 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 lets me know that you're on? And you're He's out in fifty one hundred fly legs. He's out in fifty one. <laughs> Comes yeah, on to one of five. <laughs> yeah, I I I sort of would want to be there in the first hundred fly. Um, I for some reason I don't really train much butterfly, but I have some pretty easy butterfly speed um, that'll take me out. And then I think the biggest thing is from there is just my stroke rate and the backstroke. If I can hit my stroke rate spot on, then um, I think I'll be pretty competitive um, throughout the rest of the race. Mm -hmm. What's the stroke rate? 40-ish, 43-ish. All right. Yeah. Well, Luke will be there with his watch. No doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna let us know whether or not we should tune in because he's gonna know there's gonna be a commercial break in the middle of the 4 a.m yeah probably I <laughs> how do you feel about that as well so i don't know do you characterize yourself as a as a as a distance swimmer because a lot of people say 4 a.m i would think 4 a.m is a distance event but you also have a solid 2 a.m and even down to the hunter free i mean like have some range. So what do you, do you, what do you consider yourself? Um, I like to call myself a middle distance swimmer. All right. Um, because I, I feel like maybe the long distance guys, they're known as like the weirdos. Yeah. And <laughs> other weirdos. So I like to call myself the middle distance. So I'm a little bit of, you know, a little bit of everything. And I'm not the one of the weird strokes, but I guess a lot of people as a sprinter, you probably call me a long distance, but <laughs> I like to put myself in middle distance. <laughs> if I'm doing a 4 a.m., I got to break it up into 8.50s. But, <laughs> so if you're <laughs> – the tell me about 2 a.m. though. So, like, do you consider yourself uh, a 4 a.m. -er, or uh, do you feel like there's um, – the 4 a.m. is the leading edge right now, um, but there's a 2 a.m. Uh, that's coming that you're waiting to bust out yeah, I mean, I definitely think I'm a 4 a.m. Um, and the 2 a.m., I, 
I, for some reason, just can't put it all together at once, which is quite difficult um, to try get the 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 skills and the speed involved in the two AM. I think I'm just slightly not there yet. Um, I think it's probably a future project that we can work on. But yeah, definitely the four AM is the leading edge, and that's sort of what has brought me here today. Um, and the two AM is like a future little project that we can work on. Have you always known that 4am would be the one? Is that your baby? Yeah. Unfortunately, I think I knew from when I was 15 years old that it would be the one that would take me through. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just sometimes that changes. Like I was a 200 freestyler in high school that the 200 was always my baby. And then mm. that changed pretty dramatically. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can say 4am, say it loud, say it proud. You're a 4 am or no doubt about that. You might be the first 4 am on the show. We've had like 80 guests. Come no respect. Back. No respect for IMers. What's going on with that? Yeah, who are we at? Just because Phelps is gone. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. you guys are so far away from the world record. <laughs> oh! <laughs> you're not wrong. Luke's you're not wrong. It could be that. <laughs> According to Luke, he, Phelps said that he could, that he might have been able to get under four minutes. What, is, yeah. what, is, what do you think about that? I mean, when you look at the splits, you have to go 55, 00, 110, 55. Um, and he was, he was pretty close. Um, yeah, on the Peacock, uh, he had this Olympic special where he broke down every one of his Olympic races. And I'm pretty sure he said he, he was coasting because he knew how many events he had uh, at the well, end. Uh, and he's like, my freestyle, I think that's when he went 142. He's like, my freestyle is in top form. It, it could have been, but I don't know. That's, that's flying. You know, yeah. Lewis, according to your ISL profile, uh, your specialty is that you start strong and you finish strong. <laughs> but your middle is crap. <laughs> Fair enough. My so, back stroke and breast stroke. So I'm, I'm glad that they know that. <laughs> hey, maybe, maybe, maybe you got a four double O in you at some point. <laughs> I thought it meant like a 0.5 okay. reaction time. <laughs> talk about surf life saving and 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 how that 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 helps you become you know keep interested in the sport but also just keep interested and happy and 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 keep your sanity in your teenage years and and you know good advice to others uh, the role of surf life saving yeah i mean for me as a new zealander we're i think none of us are more than 45 minutes away from a beach and so surf or going to the beach and the beach life is you know super popular in new zealand mm -hmm. um and so the sport of surf life saving is actually quite big um definitely in australia but also in new zealand and i started when i was younger and um it's sort of just the fun part of swimming you don't really have to train a lot if you're just a swimmer and you sort of just go to the beach during summer and do a few events and sort of just have fun and i think when i was younger it was too serious and when i started surf fly saving it brought back the fun for me and i realized that yeah the sport of swimming is a serious sport but if i want to do well i need to have fun and mm -hmm. that's where i found it in surf fly saving and um going to the beach was just yeah something that every kiwi wants to do during the summer holidays and it's yeah it's just the lifestyle here I don't know much about a surf life saving, but it sounds like you're doing some sprint work and going all out. Do you think that helped kind of balance you out and just kind of provided some um, cross training effect that, like you said, just provided that enjoyment? Yeah. I mean, we don't do a whole lot of sprint training. Um, more so in our taper, we do like some speed work, but um, I think surf life saving probably definitely had um definitely helped me i guess with some of the sprint work that i do it it's quite an, an intense intense race so there's not many rules around um what you can and what you can't do in the race you all sort of start on the line and then you race to a, bo a boy out on the ocean a, bo a boy i don't know what you guys call it in america and then you sort of, <laughs> you sort of go around it and come back and in between that time from the start line and the finish line 
you probably had your togs pulled down once. You've probably been hit in the face a few times and swum over, you know, half the time as well. So I think it makes you um, learn to sprint and to try to get away from those bad situations. So for me, I um, competed at an international competition in twenty in the twenty seventeen. And I had these Aussie guys climbing all over me and, you know, hitting me in the face and stuff. Um, and I guess that just taught me um, the basics of just <laughs> how to save yourself from those situations and swim fast at the start and not and just pretty much back yourself that you've got enough to hold on. How to avoid a swim brawl. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Brian and John, what are togs? What I, don't know, I was going to ask. You don't know what togs are. They don't know what togs are. And I want you, Lewis, to describe how you how one wears togs when they're rowing in surf life sailing. One wears togs? Yeah, how does one wear, wear, wear your togs when you're rowing, when you're on the boats? Oh, when they're on the boats. Ah, oh, so first of all, I'll explain what togs are. Do, do you not know what togs are? No. No um, idea. Well, there's heaps of there's heaps of different words for them. You guys use like swimsuit or training suit, I think. <laughs> that, that's what I was assuming that it was. I also yeah. thought you said tongs like with an N. <laughs> yeah, tongs. tongs? You, you're using thongs in the pool? Is that what we're talking about? <laughs> but listen to how he wears them. When right. he's so when, I mean, I don't do personally do the, the boats, but um, it's, there's a, what we call um, surf boats and it's like rowing in the ocean and they ride the waves and stuff. And pretty much what they do is they um, stick the togs up their butt and they it looks like a um, big wedgie. Yeah, big wedgie. Uh -huh. or, yeah. Yeah. Easiest yeah. way to explain it. <laughs> well, he doesn't do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Cheek -tellers. laughs> you got to get tan all around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> New Zealand is a beautiful country. I've privilege to spend time there but i never went in the water because new, new zealand is known for having no predators so no snakes nothing that can kill stuff except in the water like Lewis <laughs> yeah i'm pretty dangerous in the water you don't want to swim me <laughs> all right well this is a swimming podcast let's get back to some swimming here. <laughs> um, in the pool so one thing i've been curious about is we see these um, new zealand events and no one's wearing masks people are doing in regular life for the most part. Tokyo, I assume people are going to be wearing masks. It's going to be highly regulated and things like that. How are you preparing for that or what type of concerns do you have heading into Tokyo? Yeah, I mean, we're pretty fortunate here that as soon as COVID broke out, um, we shut the whole country down. And when you go in and out of the country, um, you have to go through a two-week, I guess, quarantine in a hotel. So that's sort of stopping all the COVID cases at the border. So pretty much for us, that means that we don't have to have any restriction on what we do. We don't have to wear masks. Yeah, big class in New Zealand. Thanks, just impressive. <laughs> yeah. So in the community, we have we don't have any um, COVID cases at the moment. Touch wood that stays like that. Um, but yeah, I guess for us going over to japan it's going to be a whole different scenario we're going to have to wear masks and it's yeah i don't think we really know what is you know what is to be expected and reading some of the playbooks that the olympic committee has put out um it's definitely pretty scary <laughs> um but for me i guess i'm lucky that i went away to I isl last year so i sort of experienced um, wearing masks and stuff. So that was the first time I'd ever worn a mask in my life going to ISL. Um, so I sort of know what's expected. Um, I know it's definitely a lot more difficult. Um, it definitely takes a bit of a mental strain on you having to think about those extra few things. Um, but yeah, it's just one of the things that I think we're going to have to deal with. And we went on a camp end of last year, a New Zealand team camp, and we sort of practiced some of those scenarios. Mm -hmm. Um, as a team and you know it was difficult for everyone to realize that you know this is a serious thing and just because we're in New Zealand we're quite sheltered from it um we don't really know what to expect when we go away I want to say one of the previous guests it might be Matt Richards or Joe Litchfield said that they practice that whole routine in practice so the whole that they've totally imagined they're in Tokyo with, you know, only allowing to have just your bag with the, you know, your suit and getting dressed, the whole scenario they've practiced a few times. 
and that's critical. And as Dick Bound said recently, you're going to a virtual like pandemic center where it, 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 you're unregulated. So it's it's yeah, it's a lot of mental stress stress for you as well, right? We kind of used it in the states, but yeah, it's gonna be. Yeah, it is going to be a huge strain on us, and I think that's the one of the biggest things that, as a as a Kiwi or the Aussies, we're going to have to be very careful with, and making sure that it's not going to take too much of a strain on us when we're we're there to perform and race. What's the vaccination vaccination mm. process and situation in New Zealand when you have zero cases? I'm curious to see um, what it's like over there. Yeah, I think um, they started with our border workers, so the people that work in the quarantine facilities, and then they went health um, people, so people that work in you know the health sector. Um, and then for us, we're pretty lucky that um, the Olympic athletes were able to get it early. So we've, we're, I've had my second one just last week, which mm-hmm. is pretty, pretty lucky because it's quite it is quite slow, um, and I guess the vaccination didn't arrive in New Zealand um, until quite late into the, uh, well, compared to the U S or whatever, because I think we held back on it purely for the fact that, you know, we're living a pretty normal life and we should probably prioritize, um, you know, the countries that are a little bit worse off than us. Um, but it is good. It is slow. And, you know, most, of, I think there's only like a couple hundred thousand people that have been vaccinated so far. Um, but, you know, we only have 5 million people in the country as well. So we don't actually have a lot of people to, to vaccinate. So I think we'll have probably most of the country done by the end of the year. We can't really relate to that selfless approach. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, our, our, our country that John and I can claim uh, is, is, is not quite so, uh, so open with our vaccine supply. Yeah. Yeah, not not our proudest moment. Not all the ones that are going to waste. But um, but what else are you doing for the next? I mean, how far are we away from Tokyo? So what what's what's your training like now? When you you did weights earlier today, did you? I mean, what, what how you, what phase you're in? How you're planning? You mentioned you might be going to Melbourne. What's your rough schedule for the next two months? Yeah, I mean, I don't really know a whole lot about that sort of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Luckily, my coach sort of that's his job. Yeah, I just do my job, which is to swim. Um, but at the moment, we've had sort of um, six weeks of a rebuild phase. I was hoping that would have, um, you know, a little adaptation week or something, a little easy week somewhere in there. But it wasn't it wasn't part of the plan, unfortunately. So we've just been going at it for like six weeks. And next week, we have a little bit of a rest week, um, which is a little bit where we where we do most of our sprinting stuff, a um, little bit of shorter stuff, and just give the body a little bit time to reset, recover, and then go into. I think we've got one more um, cycle to go through before we start our taper. Um, and so, start of July, we are going to be traveling to Auckland, which is where the the main swimming centre is in the country, and we'll go into a New Zealand team camp, um, which will be a couple of weeks long and then we'll travel over to Tokyo hopefully on the 17th of July I think and then we'll be able to swim for a couple of days I think and then yeah straight into racing for me what's a painful set for you like like what, what oh, what's a painful workout for you like you got right back into it it's a 4 a.m what's something like oh my god that was yeah it takes a while to recover um so I've done this one set and I've done it every single Thursday night since trials and it's this um we think it's a rainbow set we call it a rainbow set and it's three four hundreds three three hundreds three two hundreds eight one hundreds eight one hundreds all freestyle um so we do quite a lot of freestyle sets and the time you only get like i think the the four hundreds are on 450 the three hundreds are on 340 the 200s are on 2.30, and then the 100s, you get a little bit more rest going, 140 for the first eight, and then two minutes for the, the last eight. So mm-hmm. your heart rate's like maxed out pretty much the whole time, but for the 400s, you sort of – we have time goals, but the heart rate goals – we have heart rate goals as well, so he wants your heart rate to be really low in the 400s and then get higher as the set goes on. And most of the time, or the last six weeks, my heart rate's like maxed out from the start of the set. So it's been 
probably been the most difficult part of the past six weeks or the, the hardest set that I've done over the last six weeks, definitely. <laughs> what's the goal of that set? What's he trying to improve upon and work on? I think it's just to see a general gauge to where I'm at. Mm-hmm. We, we, do, we do that set quite often um, throughout the season and it's sort of just to see um, exactly where the fitness is at and how fast we're swimming compared to how much effort and what our heart rate is. Um, yeah. That's pretty much the main reason, I think. Do you save the set for the long course pool? Uh, no. We do. We usually do like 30, 50s long course um, on a Saturday morning or something similar. Okay, so is this one in short course meters or the 33-meter pool? The 33-meter pool. pool, yeah. It's actually like it adds up to be, I think, 201 meters for a 200. Uh-huh. So it's, even, like, it's real weird distance. Okay. <laughs> that is weird so uh so what sort of times are you holding then uh when you get to the final eight ones let's say with only five turns in a 200 yeah yeah um yeah so six laps uh mm-hmm. for the hundreds um ideally under 57s or 50 57 ish that's solid yeah well, well, these gluttons of punishment want to talk about your hard sets. Um, let's talk about leading into taper, leading into Tokyo. I'm assuming no more meets before Tokyo. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, just just training and taper. So during taper, what's a set that you like to do when you feel like, all right, I'm I'm on it. I'm feeling good. This is I'm dialed in. A four hundred. Three one hundreds, eight one hundreds, forty-seven meter pool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we have this one set that's um, pretty much we do a whole lot of hundreds, which sort of gives us a gauge about where we are at. But I think, do you say a whole set, lot of hundreds? <laughs> yeah, like we start off with like twelve one hundreds max, or maybe 16 100s max at the start of taper and it sort of trickles down to four 100s oh. of the the taper um but i think the the set that um makes me feel like i'm ready and it sort of gives me a gauge of where i'm at is i think we do like an 850s time trial or something similar to that um whether it's in a 50 meter pool or the 33 meter pool it's um slightly different um but 850s sort of at 400 am pace or or quicker um, I think last time we did it, we we tried going for um, like as fast as possible, and it sort of just gives me a gauge of where I'm at and how I'm feeling, and um, yeah, w- what I need to work on moving forward. The last sort of little little bit that we have left for, until we race. That's what Ian Thorpe said, isn't it? Ian yeah, probably. Did, yeah, he did that kind of stuff. Eight fifties for the four hundred free. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think more swimmers would benefit from training in untraditional distance pools? Because the reason I ask this, there's a lot of research on like having an athlete, not swimmers, but other athletes train at a different speed. Say we're going to do 10 100s on 110, but it's actually at 107. You just tell them it's at 110 and they assume, oh, 110, I can make that. And they go 107s over and over and over. Do you think that different length pool actually could benefit other swimmers because they, you don't have a gauge you don't really know as much yeah i mean it's difficult because i guess i've trained in the 33 meter pool my whole life so i know exactly mm, that's true like, um, yeah yeah i think i mean it probably does i think it's whether you like 33 meters or not i think if you don't have a choice um it's sort of i guess it's all about adversity and trying to overcome those small challenges that you don't really have a choice about. And mm-hmm. so, for me, you know, obviously I've had to deal with these problems of facilities and not getting the right pool space and stuff. It makes you overcome these like huge hurdles and these challenges. And it sort of gives you adversity when it comes to the time when you're racing. And you know that um, if anything is thrown at you, like a bad situation where you can't warm up properly or whatever, you've sort of haven't really had all the right things go on during your training anyway. So say for someone that has been sheltered their whole life, that's had all the best facilities in the world and never had to work for it. um, It might throw them off if they don't get something that they usually would have. And for me who hasn't had 
all the facilities that you know I could would it you know that I would want or I could the pull time that I need um, to have something thrown at me like a curveball might not affect me as much. So I think um, yeah. A public swimmer jumps in a lane with you unexpectedly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What were you going to say, John? You got it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, I, like I said, I think the – the different length pools and all that. It's just find it fascinating because I think there's a lot of room for swimmers to expand their training base and to train different ways than, than what they're used to, because we're so fixated on times, right? Every summer is like dialed in on times, even the summers that we talk to um, that have no idea about their times and no idea what's going on in practice. They're still very dialed in on what the feel should be and all that. So that's why I'm in, intrigued with these different possible training modules. And obviously when you're training at different length pools, I, I find it fascinating. But like you said, when you're used to it, you're kind of used to it, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, I encourage you guys, if you want to come over to New Zealand, when the borders open up, we can throw you in the 33 meter pool and we can see how those 50 freestyles go. <laughs> Listen, man, I'm, I got the training word. We have a 30 uh, meter pool. Uh, where we train pretty regularly and i don't know if these guys do but i get into that end uh on a pretty regular basis so i kind of like it for that reason exactly because i'm like what do i what sort of intervals uh do i need to do on this set and it is a little bit longer i can tell that it's uh provides a little bit more swimming fitness than it does for yards so yeah but that pool has three t's at each end so the three t's mess me up i'm coming into the wall then I'm coming into the wall, and I'm coming into the wall. <laughs> uh, I don't know, man, but if I'm coming to New Zealand, I'm not coming for a 33-meter pool. I'm coming to, you know, hike some trails and uh, yeah, beaches, see some of the country, maybe surf. I don't know. Whatever. What what sorts of things uh, are must-haves that we got to get into on our first trip to New Zealand? No, Go on. Sorry. Um, I mean, if you're going to come to Wellington in particular. Sure. Um, you got to pick up some windsurfing or kite surfing, absolutely, because right. I think we're known as the windiest capital city or windiest city in the world. So it's quite often where we've got over 100 kilometer an hour winds. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess you've got to know the ocean life. It's you live in the you live in the water, I guess, during summer. You, I think. Part of you know the New Zealand culture is over summer you go to the beaches and I think the beaches you gotta you gotta know um, yeah swimming in the ocean yeah as sport um, you gotta know rugby because if you if you come to New Zealand and you don't know rugby then you probably get rip, ripped to shreds. <laughs> don't mention Kiwi. I don't. <laughs> you gotta go to Queenstown. I love Queenstown. It's, it's amazing. Um, that sorry yeah. <laughs> queenstown is beautiful down there it's like the swiss alps oh, queenstown. yeah yeah yeah. i've never been but i want to go but queenstown is stunning stunning in, down, it's a yeah. gnarly plane ride but it's amazing yeah you, i think you come through um you come through the mountains to land yeah. like randomly just over yeah. a lake it just drops in yeah, yeah. Uh, it's beautiful country nice okay Let's all right isl did you apply for the draft? I have, yes. <laughs> All right. What are you excited about for season three? Um, I'm not sure. Hmm. It's going to be hard for me because it's – I mean, it's going to be hard for every summer because it's after Olympics, I think. And I – for me, I sort of just – I think I would – I'm sort of trying to balance if I actually want to go to ISL this, this season. Um, it's difficult because we still have to go through our two-week quarantine when we come home, and yeah, and it's like I think it's it's quite a bit of money, um, because you have to pay, and so if we go to if we come if I come straight home after Olympics, I don't have to pay, but if I stay and go to, to the ISL, um, I'll have to pay myself. Um, but I think for me, if I was to go to ISL again, um, the my biggest sort of thing I'm looking forward to, or the thing I want to get out of it is just to see how I compare again to those guys that I raced last year and to see if I've improved those small little skills that I, I have been working on for the past sort of six to 12 months um, since going to ISL. Again, huh. yeah. 
So the teams don't pay for your travel to get there. Um, they try f- or they pay for your travel, um, but they don't cover the quarantine costs uh, when you return to your country. So I had to oh. pay. Like- Got it. Okay. So tell me more. Like, so I know people that have applied. Say you get drafted, you just say, "Oh, I'm not interested." And then, then what happens with the other spots? Does anyone have any idea? Um, I've got no idea because I haven't really had much um, contact. I know that the New York Breakers that we've been sending, they've been sending us a few more messages, um, but I've been pretty out of the loop. I'm not sure if you know they haven't told me if they're going to draft me yet or not, or what's going to happen. Um, I feel like some of the guys in the team know if they're going to be drafted from the New York Breakers again. Um, but I've got no idea. <laughs> you medal you medal in Tokyo, you're gonna get some people knocking on your door. There's no doubt. Uh, the draft comes before Tokyo. Well then yeah. well they, the, the good GMs are paying attention to that trial swim. Right. And the draft comes before US trials too, I think. It does, I think. Mm. Yeah, I mean that hundred three you went, what forty eight nine? Pretty versatile, dude. I mean, yeah. I think that's probably the biggest thing for me. Um, I can sort of cover a few bases that, you know, might I might not be the fastest in the world, but I can be the swimmer that can can help out those events that maybe not everyone can do. All right, Lewis, I got some rapid fire questions for you to close out. Sweet. What's the hardest race in swimming? Turn it back short. Long course or short course? Long course, just because it hurts your legs. <laughs> yeah. Olympic gold, world record, or ISL MVP? Ooh. Um, I'm going to say Olympic gold. Are you a big deal in New Zealand? Do people know who you are? Um, I don't think so. Um, if you're not a rugby player, I think you you sort of get shadowed a little bit. Yeah, and people jump in your lane in a public swimming pool. <laughs> So if you, if you don't get drafted by the New York Breakers, then which team do you want to pick you up? Um, well, I've been talking to a few other fellow Kiwis that um, are hoping to go over again this year. Um, I think there was three of us that went over last year. And they're a part of LA Current. And I think I'd like to be a part of LA Current. I'm not sure. But, I mean, I don't really mind. If I'm a part of a team, I'm a part of a team. I think just being in that environment um, would be pretty sweet. It's Luke's favorite team. Good coach, Brian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. What yeah. about him? <laughs> oh, the current coach was my college coach. Um, uh, <laughs> so uh, if you could start an ISL team, what would you call it? Oh, um, I would want to bring it back to something um, from the New Zealand culture. Yeah. I wouldn't know the act, the exact name, but it would be something from the Te Deo Dictionary, um, which is the Maori language, but I'm not sure what I'd want to call it. All right. Have you considered, since you're having trouble getting through Melbourne to get to Tokyo, um, and you're clearly not interested in the cruise ship idea, uh, have you thought about reaching out to the America's Cup team and seeing if they'd give you a ride? Yeah, true. Um well, I think a, no, a few of them are actually traveling over themselves, so maybe they'll be able to give me a ride if they if they want to take their boat with, with them. I mean, it's the fastest in the world, right? <laughs> oh, sail right there. You could train in the ocean. You could do some speed work. They'd tow you behind the boat. It's great. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, do you have any swim meet traditions that you'll bring with you to Tokyo? Um, oh, good question. I don't think so. Um I guess I have my routines that I do every time, like my stretching and my warm-up routines, but mm-hmm. traditions are uh, not so much. I don't think I've built any over the years as of yet. All right. Well, maybe the tradition is podiums and medals. What yeah. time you, you, you said you'd have to go a couple seconds faster. What time do you think it'll take to medal in the 4 a.m.? I think 407. 407 what? Anything? Hi. Hi. I think you're yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, around there. I don't anybody's fast right now. Will you do the haka for us? 
<laughs> not right now, but maybe if I do a medal, if I get a medal at Olympics, maybe it'll happen. Deal. All right, we'll take you up on it. <laughs> well, Lewis, it's fun to chat. Good luck with Taper uh, and the final weeks of prep. Good luck getting to Tokyo. I'm sure you'll make it, and uh, I'm sure you're going to smash it. We'll look forward to seeing you on day one. Thank you very much for having me. That's it for this episode of Social Kick Podcast. We'll see you next time. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you're enjoying Social Kick, tell your friends about it. And be sure to tell us what you liked by leaving a comment and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at The Social Kick Podcast. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Social Kick. And you can find all of our content on our website at thesocialkick.com.